Hello. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with you today in a country that has led the transition towards clean energy around the world. I'm going to talk today about the disruption of the world's largest industry. Energy is a six trillion dollar a year industry, and as in so many other sectors, exponential technology is disrupting it. Now, you've heard a bit about me already. Uh, my background is really in technology. I spent 13 years at Microsoft. I've been the CEO of a tech startup. Uh, some of you might know that I write science fiction, which is how I'm best known around the world. If you've heard of Elon Musk's Neuralink, this is a sort of similar concepts. And if you read in German, the first two books of this trilogy are out in German right now, and the third book is coming soon. A few years ago, though, my interest really turned towards the environment, the challenges we face on planet Earth, and how could we address them. And so I wrote this book about the power of innovation to overcome some of the resource issues and environmental issues that we have. And that led me to go deep into what's happening in clean energy and to discover the exponentials that were there. And that, in turn, has led me to being an investor in early stage clean energy startups. I used the Angelus platform where any of you can join me if you so choose. Now, why do we care about energy at all? Why do we talk about it here? Well, here's a question for you. Who knows what this place is? Shanghai. Shanghai. Very good. This is Shanghai. Any idea when this was? 1990. This is Shanghai. And this is Shanghai now. So that, in fact, this is 2013, so that's 23 years. In 23 years, we're talking about a transformation from a nearly 19th century existence to a 21st century existence. So we're talking about the uplift of not just people in Shanghai, not just in China, but billions of people around the world out of poverty, the historical state of humanity, and into this future existence that we're living now. But to accomplish that, there's a tremendous use of physical resources. There's the concrete and steel in these buildings. There's the energy to construct them. There's electricity to keep the lights on. There's the energy to transport people and goods. Energy is the master resource, if you will. It's the resource that makes all other civilizational progress possible, whether it's moving our goods from A to B, uh, if we're talking about the cloud and the digital transformation that we've talked about so much, 15% of the world's electricity is now used in IT and it's the fastest growing sector. If we're talking about the need to nearly double our food production over the next 50 years. More energy allows you to grow more food on less land and spare more of it for nature. We're talking about a billion people that don't have access to clean water today. Enough energy allows you to turn dirty water or salt water into fresh water. Right? That's why we need it. But there are consequences of how we use energy today. This is also Shanghai on a less good day. And it's not that uncommon. The World Health Organization estimates that air pollution almost entirely from combustion of fuels for energy, kills five to six million people around the world today. And that's just the most obvious tangible issue. Of course, we have this larger systemic issue around us, which is that the planet has a fever. 2015 was the warmest recorded year in modern history around the world. 2016 blew that record away. 2017 passed 2016. So we have three record hot years in a row. The planet is undeniably warming. And while probably 2018, 2017 will be a bit cooler, a few years will pass and we'll set more records. The pace at which we have to remove carbon from our economy to stay below the two degrees Celsius that scientists believe is safe is unprecedented. We have to cut our carbon emissions by a factor of five in the next 35 to 40 years. This is a graph of the Paris Agreement in color and how fast we have to cut our emissions in the top line. And we have to go faster than we've already agreed to. So we have a very serious situation. Yet I'm an optimist that it can be done. And I'm an optimist for a couple of reasons. One is that we have tremendous access to clean energy. 
If you take all of the world's use of fossil fuels, express it as this drop of oil, it would be about 14 cubic kilometers of oil, actually. But that amount is dwarfed by the continual influx of energy from the fusion reactor in the sky, our sun, that hits our planet at the top of the atmosphere with 10,000 times as much energy as we use from all sources combined. So there's no shortage of clean energy if we can find a way to access it. In fact, one day of humanity's energy needs is met by the energy content of just 10 seconds of sunlight hitting the top of our atmosphere. One year of humanity's energy needs is met by the energy content of just one hour of the sunlight hitting our planet. The issue is not available energy. The issue has been always economics. Can we capture this energy cost effectively? People will choose the cheapest energy that they can find in general. And historically, clean energy has been more expensive, but that is changing. It's changing in wind power, for instance. Germany is one of the world's leaders in wind power. Winds are abundant in the north of Europe. Wind power was a footnote in the world's energy mix uh, just a decade ago. But in the last 10 or so years, the amount of wind power deployed around the world has grown by 1,000% an order of magnitude in 11 years. That's not normal in energy, which is a slow-moving area. Now, this has happened, why? Why have we deployed more wind power? Yell it out, you'll probably be right. Subsidies, very good. A policy decision was made to deploy more wind power. But that's only half of the reason. Because had it been a policy decision, but the technology stayed the same, we would still be at minuscule amounts deployed. But that policy decision to deploy more also led to this innovation in the field that led to an exponential decline in the cost of wind power. Wholesale grid electricity costs perhaps six US cents per kilowatt hour. In the 1980, wind power cost maybe 10 times that on land. And the cost has come down to the point that now in the US last year, the average wind power contract was for just over two cents, less than half the cost of coal or gas, a more than 24 times cost reduction in that uh, 30 or so years. Now that's happened because we're building these bigger and bigger machines. The wind blows faster up high, and if you build a taller wind turbine and lengthen the blades, the amount of energy that they can capture is equal to the area the blade sweeps through. So if you double the length of a wind turbine blade, you quadruple the energy it can capture. So we see that as the size of wind turbines gets larger, that orange line of the cost drops. But that's only half the story, because wind energy is also intermittent. The wind blows sometimes and not other times, right? But as you build these larger machines, you can capture wind energy more consistently. So this is a, a measure of how consistently do wind turbines operate. And you see year over year, that goes up and up. So now on land, we have wind turbines that are at 50%, 60% of the rated capacity is what they run at on an ongoing basis. And that is going up by about a percent a year. Turning what was once an intermittent wind power or energy source into something that is more of a stable baseload source. Now in Germany and throughout most of Europe, wind power has been pushed off land because increasingly in a dense populated area, people don't want a wind turbine near them. And so we're building more and more wind turbines out at sea. And these have been historically tremendously expensive, far more expensive to build offshore wind power than to build onshore. You have to build these foundations that are on the seabed. You have to transmit the energy from far offshore, potentially. But that has changed tremendously in just the last few years. In the last four years, the cost of offshore wind power has dropped in half. And that has led to some breakthrough prices. Just last year, it dropped about 25%. And the Danes built a new wind uh, or contract for a new offshore wind farm at a record low price. And just 
Three weeks ago, we had a pivotal event in Germany, which is in the North Sea, we had a wind power auction happen for Germany that brought in a, a seminal moment, which was for the first time an offshore wind contract signed at wholesale market rates, zero subsidies by ENBW here. A giant plant, 900 megawatts. It'll probably produce power with a 70 or 80% capacity factor, meaning it's incredibly steady. And for the first time, it is simply at market rates. And that's important because technology only gets cheaper. So the future of these turbines will be lower and lower prices that are actually going to undercut the price of other sources of electricity like coal on land. And Siemens, by the way, has plans to build next generation turbines that you'll see in the far right here with a span twice the size of an Airbus 380. These gigantic machines using new technologies, new materials, big data to make sure that they're uh, always operating most effectively that will further bring down the price. So wind power is going to keep getting cheaper, and it's now on the verge of becoming simply the cheapest energy you can buy without subsidies in the north of Europe. But I want to talk about solar power, because this has a pace of innovation that makes wind power look slow and stagnant. We have all this solar energy coming in, but solar power used to be ridiculously expensive. That has changed. In 1977, a watt of solar panel cost $77. Right? Today, you can buy it from Malaysia for 36 cents, a 200 times price reduction in the cost of solar technology. That is unlike anything in physical inf infrastructure. You don't see that for tractors or for building roads or trains or buildings, nothing like that. It is most similar to the price reduction that we see in digital technology. It is like energy is becoming digital. And this means that we're now seeing a crossover in solar. And by crossover, I mean the point at which solar, with zero subsidies, is in sunny parts of the world simply the cheapest thing that you can buy. Let me give you some examples of that. A new natural gas plant will cost you somewhere between six and eight US cents per kilowatt hour. Just remember that number, six to eight. Now what we see is in the west of China, the Gobi Desert, a gigantic solar plant being built at six cents a kilowatt hour. In the US, uh, in California, Palo Alto, where all the venture capitalists are, factor out all the subsidies in this deal signed late last year, 5.1 US cents per kilowatt hour. And you can see in the US, the price of solar power, whole system price, has dropped by a factor of five in the last eight years or so. In India, just signed about six weeks ago, the Rewa Ultra Mega Solar Plant, 4.5 cents per kilowatt hour, no subsidies, undercutting the price of coal in India, the biggest growing coal uh, consumer in the world. In Mexico, power auction late last year, 5.1 cents was the average. The lowest price was 3.5 cents, about half the price of gas or coal there from an Italian company, actually, Enel. In Chile, we've had probably a dozen deals where solar has just won all of the auction. And we've had a, a record low was set there, September of last year, 2.91 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, this record low price was not just the cheapest price for solar we'd ever seen. It was the cheapest contract for electricity ever signed on planet Earth with any technology. And that record lasted for about three weeks until this happens, my favorite picture. In Dubai, uh, the second tranche of a 1.3 gigawatt, a giant plant, the size of a, a large coal or nuclear plant, this price came in at less than two and a half cents per kilowatt hour. And it wasn't just one company taking a, a massive risk. There were four bids, all under three cents per kilowatt hour. This is the new normal price for the sunniest parts of the world. Right? And of course, how sunny a place is, is important. In the US, I live in Seattle, in the upper northwest. We don't see a lot of solar there. The solar starts where the sun is, in the southwest. Around the world, there's 1.3 billion people without access to electricity. Where do they live? 
sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, they live almost entirely in some of the sunniest parts of the world. And so they will get some of the cheapest electricity to come. So I told you that solar makes wind look slow. Wind power scaled by 10x over 11 years. Solar power has grown by a hundredfold over the course of about 13 years. And if we take that growth and put it on a log chart, you know, if you take an exponential process, it looks like a hockey stick. Put it on a log scale, it looks like a straight line. This is the growth of solar around the world. This has been an exponential trend. About 35%, 40% growth per year. It will slow eventually, it must. But for right now, it is continuing to explode exponentially. Now, I want to bring this back to Germany. Because a lot of the reason that solar has exploded are decisions, political decisions, made in Germany uh, one to two decades ago. And this is how much sunshine Germany gets, or Europe as a whole. And you'll notice Germany is not the sunniest place in the world. In, in fact, the north of Europe is about the least sunny place where any substantial number of people on Earth live. It is. And I have some opinions on, on what Germany should do going forward, but I want to stop and say something, which is that the German people deserve a huge round of applause. Because the political decision made here to start deploying renewables is the reason that renewables have become so cheap for the entire world. Let me elaborate on that. We've known about something called the learning curve. It's a fundamental exponential that exists in basically all manufactured goods since the Ford Model T. With the Ford Model T, we can go back and look at the data and say, as the volume of production went up, that's the horizontal axis on a log scale, the price came down. That's the learning curve. You heard yesterday about Swanson's Law. Swanson's Law is the learning curve in solar. As the volume of solar made has gone up on a log scale, the price has come down on a log scale. And so there's this fundamental virtuous cycle that exists in basically all exponential technologies, which is at first, it's an expensive technology. But then you hit some price level that's low enough that there is some market that exists. And that causes you to tap into that market. That increases demand. And increasing demand and increasing the scale brings down the prices further, which allows you to tap into more markets, which allows you to increase scale and bring the prices down again. And the thing that bootstrapped this virtuous cycle in solar was Germany's choices and Germany's actions. So I wanted to stop, yes, and say you should all thank yourselves for that. And now we've entered a new domain, because now that we have solar and wind that are coming in unsubsidized as the cheapest sources of power in certain regions, this virtuous cycle becomes self-sustaining. Even if we took away all renewable energy policies in the world today, this virtuous cycle would continue. Now, it will continue faster with those policies. I think we should leave them in place. But we have hit this point where the transition is no longer a matter of if. It's now just a matter of when. So there are still issues, though. What do we do if the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing? Well, the first thing we have to think about is the power of the grid. We think about renewables as making us off-grid, but that's not the case. In fact, the grid becomes more useful when you're using renewables for reasons like this. This is a perfect day in California, and you see the sun shines during the day, 24 hours here, and the wind, of course, can blow at any time, but statistically, winds blow faster at night. Or look at the course of a year here in Germany. In the summer months, we have lots of sunshine, lots of solar power production in Germany. Statistically, the wind blows faster in winter. And so in winter, when there's less sun, there's more wind. So wind and solar complement each other. But this happens not just over time, it happens over geography. And now I want to come back to this mix of energy resources in Europe. Because the most logical thing for Europe to do is to not treat each nation as an energy island. In the long run, it makes the most sense for Germany to import solar from the south, from Spain, Italy perhaps, Greece, where sunshine is more abundant, and for the northern European countries where there are abundant wind to export that to the southern countries during the wintertime. Europe needs to take these interconnections that exist between countries and increase them and build a truly European energy grid. Renewables, the science shows, work best at the scale of continents and not just nations. And the technology 
to do that exists today. It is a matter, again, of political will, of deciding that this is the future. Now, with the grid, you can get to maybe 70% of Europe's energy consumption being just solar and wind. But eventually, you have to get to something else. And that something else is energy storage. And energy storage is the next solar. It is coming down in price similar to the way that solar has, and its potential is enormous. You all know who this is? Tony Stark? I hope I didn't give it away. Uh, Tony here, I mean, Elon here is introducing the Tesla Powerwall. The Tesla Powerwall is not even a Tesla product, really. It's actually Panasonic technology inside of a Tesla uh, package. And the reason he's able to introduce this is not some sudden new breakthrough in technology. It's that batteries are an exponential technology. If you chart battery performance over a 15-year period, we find that over that time, the capacity of a battery, lithium ion, tripled per unit weight, and the cost of lithium ion dropped by a factor of 10. And that, again, is a function of scale, and it's been ongoing for at least 25 or 30 years, actually. And so when you take forecasters who forecast the future of batteries and don't take this into account, the future of battery prices, here's the forecasts. But Tesla is on pace to beat all of these with a five times battery price reduction in the next five years. So the prices are entering this zone where they provide real value. In fact, if we look at Germany, Look at the cost of electricity is the top line going up. The feed-in tariffs for solar is the bottom line going down. The gap between those, if a battery is cheaper than that, it makes sense to have a battery at home to save the energy for yourself and use it at night. And guess what? We've just entered the zone where that gap is larger than the price of batteries. So it now, on paper, makes sense for German homes that have solar to also deploy batteries. And in fact, the math says that a German home with a battery half the size of a Tesla Powerwall in the summer months will produce 70% of its own electricity and would be saving money versus using the grid at night. But most of the battery market is probably going to be at the big utility scale. Tesla had about $1 billion of orders for their battery product in the first week, and 90% of that was at the utility or commercial scale. And what's interesting there is that those batteries are already cheaper than a certain type of power plant we call the, a natural gas peaking plant that provides the power at the peak demand times of the day in the late afternoon. And there's hundreds of billions of dollars of investment in these natural gas plants, and they may now all be obsolete. But just as important, it means that there's now a market for batteries to sell into with no subsidies, and they start to have this similar effect. As the scale goes up, the price comes down, right? And in fact, if we look at the pace at which battery prices drop, the top line here is how fast solar prices drop as a function of scale, and the bottom, the blue diamonds, is the price reduction of batteries as a function of scale. And they're nearly identical. They both drop in price by a little over 20% per doubling of scale. But batteries are much earlier in their life. So the batteries essentially are where solar was in 2000. They're still expensive, but they're poised for an incredible plunge in price as this virtual cycle kicks in. And that's going to be massively disruptive to how we use energy. Now, I want to step back and just say, if we think about this, we're talking about a crazy proposition. We've always assumed that clean energy was going to be more expensive than dirty energy. But we should do it anyway, because it's the right thing to do. But if you imagine that the cost of fossil fuels fluctuates, but the cost of technology always does what? Always goes down. Then you say, we're headed eventually for clean energy to be the cheapest energy on the planet. Right? And even very conservative organizations are starting to say this. This is the International Energy Agency, the IEA. The IEA is not what you would call an exponential organization. Let me show you. Let me show you the IEA's forecasts for solar and read from the bottom. Okay? So from the bottom, in 2002, they had the first blue line in the bottom. In 2004, they said, oh, we're a little bit off, and they lifted the forecast. 2006, they said, oh, we're still a little bit off, and they lifted the forecast. 2008, they said, oh, we're still a little bit off, lifted the forecast. All right? They might have been just taking the same Excel macro and hitting Control-C, Control-V. <laughs> it's a little bit more varied than that. The dark blue line is how fast solar actually grew. Now, who thinks in their 2014 forecast 
the IEA is clued in and has, has got it. <laughs> you have no confidence. And you shouldn't, because there's still that red line is still linear. It's still assuming that each year we install the same amount of solar as the past, when in fact we're installing 40% more per year. And so it's actually lifting off of this line. And yet even this organization that has missed on every single solar forecast they've ever made has been too conservative, every single one, on price or scale, now says solar will be the number one source of energy by mid-century. I think they're right. They're just a little bit too late in that. And solar costs will be unbeatable on the rooftop, four cents a kilowatt hour at utility scale. We've already beaten that number in sunny places. UBS, large bank, said something in a report last year I thought I'd only ever hear myself say. Renewables are now deflationary to energy prices. And in markets like the US and in very sunny places and very windy places, that's starting to be the case. Fraunhofer Institute here in Germany uh, put together uh, this chart. You look at the wholesale price of electricity in Europe, and you look at their forecast, what the price will be like over the coming decades. They are talking about solar in mid-century in the south of Spain being one quarter the price of the rest of wholesale grid electricity, and even in the south of Germany being half the price of wholesale good electricity from coal or gas. Or my favorite of these, Alliance Bernstein is a private equity firm. They're not environmentalists. They exist to make money. They put out this report, this graph, Welcome to the Terror Dome. It's a reference to a public enemy song. If you want to look it up, Welcome to the Terror Dome. The, across the bottom, you see the price of coal, gas, and oil. And if it went out a few years more, it would have tipped down a little bit. And then someone's kid took a crayon, it looks like, and scrawled <laughs> across this, right? Now, that's the price of solar coming down in the long term. And if we add in what wind power looks like and what energy storage prices look like, that's the long-term view. That is a disruption in this market. And that starts to look like what happened to things like analog photography when digital technology came along. At first, the new technology looked ludicrously expensive, not very good, and then suddenly it disrupted the entire market. Right? And we see early signs of that today. This is Peabody Coal, the largest private coal company in the world, massive scale, multi-hundred billion dollar company. Oh, it was. Sorry, they're bankrupt now. In the US, the top four coal companies all went bankrupt between 2013 and 2015. And now we see Australia is having similar issues. They expected to export coal to China. They're not doing it. Right? This disruption is starting with coal first, and then perhaps oil, and then perhaps gas. Now, that's all about electricity, but electricity is just one way that we use energy. So let's turn to that question of transportation and oil in particular. I believe that oil will be disrupted, and I'm not the first to say that. Let's hear what the Saudi oil minister, Sheikh Yamani, had to say back in the 1970s. The Stone Age ended because we invented bronze. There were still plenty of rocks around. And what he's warning his fellow princes of is that we are going, the world is going to invent something that is to oil what bronze was to stone. And that is happening. And that's important because oil is this incredibly large market that's also incredibly volatile. A tiny swing, 1 or 2% swing in oil demand versus supply is what has caused these huge price variations. And we are on track to do more than that through electrification of transport. Now, I didn't used to believe in electric vehicles. Three years ago, if you'd asked me, I'd said, ah, uh, they're cute, but I don't think we're going to get there. But I have been convinced by what I have seen. One of the things that I've seen is the incredible pace of growth. Electric vehicles are a tiny fraction of the market. They're only 0.1% of all cars on the road. They're 1% of all cars being sold. But they're growing at 73% at this enormous pace. And that's what matters in the long run. And now we have these breakout products, right? A Tesla, what is it? A Tesla is almost a spaceship or it's a computer on wheels, right? Tesla has this amazing experience. You're in a cockpit, it seems like. And more than that, there's an entirely digital device. It has functionality like your phone. 
So when Tesla first launched the Tesla Roadster, it had an issue that some drivers didn't like. In an internal combustion car, if you have the car running and it's in drive and you take your foot off the brakes, it rolls forward a little bit, right? It creeps. And in, in an electric vehicle, if you take your foot off the brake, it doesn't matter. There's no current going to the engine. It stays put. Some Tesla owners didn't like that, and they complained. So one morning, 10,000 Tesla owners got an email, and that email said, you have a new feature in your car. It's called creep. And if you turn it on, not the best choice of names, perhaps, if you <laughs> turn it on, when you take your foot off the brake, the car will roll forward. Now, any other manufacturer would have had to, they would have just waited for a later model year, or they would have had to have done a recall, bring all the cars in. Tesla just updated this on the airwaves across the mobile cellular network, updated the cars with this new feature. Right? That's what you can do with a digital product, even if it's physical. But a, a more fun feature, perhaps, is uh, years later, the Model S, several tens of thousands of people got an email one morning saying, your car has a new feature. That feature is called insane mode. <laughs> now, this is another example of an exponential, because five years ago, what were our impressions of electric vehicles? Slow, clunky, ponderous, not fun, not exciting, not luxury. But that has changed because they crossed this threshold of performance. Let me just show you what insane mode looks like. And I apologize in advance. There might be a little bit of profanity in this. I'm, I'm really mad that the option is insane. Like, it's not like just. Boy, that's that, perfect. That's, Isn't that good? That's a random, like. What's the future? The car is insane, right? <laughs> Everyone thinks the car is insane, so why not have, you know, like an insane mode, right? That makes sense. So you just come to like a complete stop. All right. And then before you know it, you just jam oh up. shit, Brooks! <laughs> what the? <f> <laughs> That's Seventy miles an hour. Brooks, oh <laughs> shit! You know, first of all, you can't fucking do that to people. <laughs> like you gotta give people fair warning. Why? Like you can't fucking just say. Yeah, you can. Brooks, what? I think I shit it in your seat. <laughs> There's more. You should watch more of these videos. The Tesla Model S is a roughly 80,000 US vehicle. It is faster than every vehicle that costs less than half a million dollars. Right? That's an exponential technology. Suddenly, the price performance of this thing that looked terrible is amazing. Now, it's still an $80,000 US vehicle, so it's not going to find a mass market. But then we had this. The Model 3 was announced, $35,000 US vehicle. And it's not just the Model 3. There's five, six, seven manufacturers that all have products in the $30,000 or less with ranges of 300 kilometers or more coming to market in the next 18 months. All right. Now, again, I'm going to pick on the forecasters. Here's the forecast by the U.S. Department of Energy of how many vehicles with a 100-mile uh, range or 200-mile range electric, would there be? The 200-mile range is in the red. Now, if you can't read that, it's because their forecast was by 2040, we'd have maybe 20 or 30,000 vehicles that were electric and had a 200-mile range total in the US. Not sold per year, total. How many Model 3s did Tesla sell? Yeah, it was like 186,000 on day one, 300,000 week one. It does actually start shipping in July. So you have one manufacturer blowing away these forecasters' views of what will happen over decades and doing it this year, next year. So bet on the innovators and not on the forecasters, is my point of view. And now again, we have this virtuous cycle. What's the most expensive part of an electric vehicle? Batteries. So as you sell more electric vehicles, you sell more batteries, battery prices come down. The electric vehicle gets cheaper, which means that you sell more electric vehicles, which results in the battery prices coming down. Again, we have this virtuous cycle for all exponential technologies applying here. And the craziest thing that I'll tell you is that it's quite likely that electric vehicles will simply be cheaper than any gasoline vehicle. And here's why. This is the entire drivetrain of an electric vehicle. It has 90% fewer moving parts than a gasoline or diesel vehicle. And so they're expensive because they're boutique objects. When they're made at scale, there's every reason to believe that they'll be substantially cheaper than any 
similar vehicle. And in fact, if we project out the rate at which they're declining in prices, we're looking at a vehicle like the Model 3 that accelerates faster than a Porsche, that has self-driving features, being cheaper than a two-seater smart car in the next decade or so. And then who's going to buy the internal combustion vehicle? Just like who buys the analog camera today? And if we play that forward, then we'll be destroying about 2 million barrels a day of oil demand by 10 years from now or so. And that's the enough to send the price of oil into a permanent slump. So I can't predict the short-term price of oil. I don't think anyone can. But I can predict the long-term price of oil, and that's cheap because it'll be a shrinking market rather than a growing market. And we have other technologies, new batteries on the market or heading that could extend the range. And these other two big trends in transportation, rides as a service, that will amplify and accelerate electric. When was the last time you got into an Uber or even a taxi and wondered how much gas was in the tank? Number one source of anxiety goes away. And self-driving, when vehicles can charge themselves, then again, consumers start to care less and less. And in both of these, the other factor, the total cost of ownership, the cost per kilometer driven of electric vehicles today is already cheaper than internal combustion vehicles. So will you call up the dirty, noisy, smelly vehicle that costs more or the sleek, smooth, self-driving one that costs less? I think we know what we'll do. All right, I want to close with talking about how to take action. So I presented a very rosy view of what's happening in technology, but I want to be really clear that we are in a race. It's not at all clear, even with all this technological progress, that we are moving fast enough. It's perhaps apocryphal that the Chinese ideogram for crisis is danger plus opportunity. We know that the danger is there. We know what these dangers are. But we also have an opportunity, not just to do the right thing for the world, but economic opportunities. And I'll give an example of how I think about that as an investor myself. When we look at the rise of solar on people's rooftops, there were three separate things that all interconnected that led to that. One was technology. The incredible price decline in solar panels made it possible. But that wouldn't have happened without policy. Policies like net metering, we call it in the US, or feed-in tariffs here, made that possible in the first place. You need the technology and the policy. And finally, how many of you here are business people? Most of you, that's what I thought. Business innovation was the final piece that unlocked this. These workers here work for SolarCity. Elon Musk and his cousin were driving back from the Burning Man Festival, and they knew that they wanted to do something in solar, but they didn't want to be another photovoltaic manufacturer. There were dozens of those, fiercely competitive market. But they just had an idea. They said people want solar on their roof, but don't have the money in their bank account to pay for it. Why don't we find a new way? Why don't we finance it? Why don't we lease it to them? We'll lease it to them at a price that saves them money, but where it generates a profit that we'll skim. It was a business model innovation that unlocked this market and really started things going. And so when we see those three things come together, technology innovation, we talk about a lot with Singularity, policy innovation that has really decided which technologies get massive investment, and then business model innovation, that's when the sweet spot occurs. And often there's a virtuous cycle between these. One leads to the other to the other. And what it requires is leadership to say, I can start this cycle spinning. I am an entrepreneur, and I know how to tap into this and start this virtuous cycle. And that, in turn, leads to, in many cases, multi-billion dollar opportunities. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ramesh. We are running a little bit late, but questions. Questions, many questions here. There's one in the middle, two here on this side. Can we quick run? Right here, yeah. So I'm not from this field, so maybe you can help me to understand. I am not sure whether we need to think about recycling these batteries, whether it's solar energy or Tesla. And if we do, do we have technologies to do so in such a massive uh, production? It's an 
Excellent question. Yes, we have to think about recycling lithium ion, and I see that as a business opportunity. So Tesla, for instance, commits to recycling all of its batteries, but right now it has to spend about $500 per pack to do that recycling. And so I look at businesses that are find, trying to find better ways for the second use out of that battery or to recycle it more efficiently. Um, so what do you think of uh, nuclear, f nuclear fusion power? Uh, is is there still demand for it because you showed uh, the solar power it might be enough uh, already? Nuclear fusion would be an excellent power source if it were here and if it were cheap. I'm more optimistic about the possibility of fusion now than at any time in the past because of these small startups that are operating in the space, but it's still a high risk, uh, sort of low probability possibility, I would think. Thank you. Another question on this side? There was one right here. I'm just wondering if you know if the technology will soon be uh, available for large-scale, long-haul flights. Mm -hmm. uh, long-haul aviation is maybe the last thing that we can electrify. There is some very promising stuff for short-range electric aviation, but uh, long-range aviation is still sort of over the horizon right now. Okay, last question. Right here in the back, please. Um, everybody talks about, you know, Tesla, the batteries getting cheaper, etc. Um, can you talk a bit about the development of the infrastructure? Because I think a lot of people would buy electrical cars, but it, it will cost billions of dollars just in Germany to develop the electricity network. Yeah? A lot of companies would, you know, put all their co corporate cars to, to electricity, but we don't have enough strong power lines in Germany. I'm, I'm missing always this, this topic when yeah. talking about electrical cars. At the end, it's all about convenience. Yeah? And if in Berlin, let's say I'm making an example, we all go skiing, yeah? we all go, you know, 2,000 people in Teslas uh, are leaving Berlin after 400 kilometers, we all meet at the power station, you know, driving to Switzerland. It's, it's very, very pragmatic uh, problems. Yeah? How are we going to solve this? Yeah. It's a real issue, but it's also a real opportunity. So we look in the US, where the numbers have been uh, run. If you include the cost of building out the infrastructure, it's still the case that the switch from gasoline vehicles to electric, if we switch the entire fleet of vehicles, of light passenger vehicles to electric, it would save US consumers about $400 billion a year in uh, reduced gasoline costs, and it would cost about $100 billion a year in electricity costs, including the infrastructure. So it's a still a net savings for the economy, is one thing. And two, for utility companies where power demand is mostly flat, this looks like a very attractive possibility because it's the one thing that can make demand go higher. And the value of those additional sales far exceeds the cost of the infrastructure to deliver it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank Thomas you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.